Hello, church family. September 20th, it's Wednesday night. We normally have a live feed, live stream of our Bible study, but since we're doing our small group streams tonight, and we're actually going to give you a pre recorded video, we're going to continue with last week's theme. This is the second of three weeks. And last week we started the series. I gave you just a brief summary, Cliff Notes version of Joseph's life, and about a five minute, I took 15 chapters of the Bible and squashed them into five minutes. And so I'm not going to do that again. If you're not familiar with the life of Joseph, I mean, many of you probably are, but if you're maybe newer Christian or you've not read the book of Genesis much, uh, you can look at last week's uh, video and, uh, and get the life of Joseph in the five minute version. Then I gave you some principles from the life of Joseph that we expounded upon from that. So that was last week's Bible study. Tonight we're going to continue with that theme of the life of Joseph and principles that we can learn from the life of Joseph. And then next Wednesday night we'll do one more week of streams. Looking forward to it. And uh, it was uh, just, I believe, a helpful study last week. So last, let me review the five points from last week. Talked about the testimony of Joseph and uh, there's a principle called your, your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Uh, so be and do and don't just say. And he was genuine. His testimony with at Potiphar's house in prison with his brethren, he had a very powerful testimony. Uh, the second thought was the words, uh, the wonder of wisdom, I should say, and uh, that ability to look at given situations and act wise and appropriately and we see Joseph do that. The third thought from last week was uh, to dream big. And if you're going to do uh, something for the Lord, dream big, have big goals, set big goals, work toward big goals. And uh, Joseph certainly did. And I uh, can't read my writing here, so i got to pull the glasses. The glasses have a funny glare on them, so I don't like to wear them too much. So, um, But um, then the fourth thought was just patience and a trusting and waiting on the Lord. And it was 14 years total for him from the time his brothers basically took advantage of him and sold him. And then, of course, all the events that transpired till he was kind of exonerated there. And uh, next week, we are going to talk about the end of his life and uh, in Genesis 50, where he gets to see multiple generations. And so uh, that little window of 14 years is but a drop in the bucket compared to his entire life. And then... Uh, the fifth thought was uh, just taking care of your business. And I, I think that's an important thing. We need people just to to, take, to pay their bills and and do all the things that are needful of you. So that was last week. Again, if, you, if you're not familiar with the life of Joseph, you can certainly look back to uh, last week and uh, the first five minutes of the Bible study and for a five-minute version of the life of Joseph. And then uh, maybe watch the whole thing and then come back and watch this one if you're not familiar with Joseph. I'm going to have a word of prayer and then we'll jump into the thoughts for tonight. Father in heaven, we thank you again for this time together. Be with our church family as a whole. We're thankful for these technologies that allow those from home to watch. And uh, we pray that you bless, bless each and every person here. We give you the praise, honor, and glory for it's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By here I mean watching. And uh, I'm going to start off by giving you about 25 similarities between Joseph of the Old Testament and Christ. And I'll go through these rather quickly. Then we'll talk about the points for today. Uh, they were both shepherds. And I have verses for these. I probably won't give you all the verses, uh, but uh, there's ample about Joseph and his uh, being a shepherd. And then Jesus, of course. Uh, both are the most loved of their fathers. And uh, we know that about Joseph. We know that about Christ. Uh, both were prophesied to be rulers. Many passages of Jesus about him being a ruler. Old Testament prophecies as well as uh, New Testament fulfillment of those prophecies. And uh, some still to come, right? And uh, in Genesis 37, of course, it talks about <coughs> you know Joseph, the, the, the vision, right, of the, uh, uh, the sheaves bowing down and then uh, the, you know, stars bowing down. And so... Um, both G Joseph's and Jesus' brothers were jealous and did not believe. And we know Jesus' half-brothers wouldn't believe until after he was resurrected. And uh, Joseph was sent by his father to his brothers. Jesus was sent by his father to his 
brothers, Israel, right? And he came into his own, his own received him not. Both of them were stripped of their coat. Jesus, uh, in the way of the crucifixion, uh, on, the, on the way to the crucifixion, I should say, and of course the story of Joseph. Uh, both of them had blood on them as well. And uh, Joseph was sold as a slave to Egypt, and Jesus was sold and sold, and both for 30 pieces of silver, or for silver. And uh, Jesus, of course, 30, Joseph 20. And uh, both went to Egypt, Jesus as a lad, and uh, as a young child. Uh, both are falsely accused and punished for a false accusation. Uh, the Bible says that both the Lord was with Joseph, the Lord was with Jesus, and the Spirit of God was with each of them as well. So uh, the Jehovah, uh, the Heavenly Father, God the Father, was with Jesus and Joseph, as was the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, the king of Egypt exalted Joseph out of slavery to, be, to rule over all and bring under the king's rule. And uh, Jesus, of course, will be exalted and will reign from the throne of David. And uh, so all the knees bowed to Joseph, all the knees will bow to Jesus. There's another one. Uh, both uh, were given a name meaning Savior. And uh, the name Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. And so Joseph has that connotation in his name as well. Uh, both were given a Gentile bride. I'll talk a little bit about uh, Joseph's Gentile bride a little bit. But, uh, of course, the Gentile bride for Christ is us, the church, right? Um, they had troublesome times that were seven years in their life. And, of course, Joseph were the seven good years and the seven bad years, and of course, there's yet to be seven years in the last week of Daniel's prophecy for Jesus and such. And uh, so the, the seven years uh, were there. Uh, so a couple more things about Joseph uh, and Jesus. They were both 30 years old when they began their work uh, that was recognized. Jesus, of course, his ministry began. At, he was age 30, according to Luke chapter 3. And uh, Joseph, according to Genesis 41, was 30 when he was exonerated uh, not exonerated, but uh, prof uh, uh, gave the prophecy of Joseph's, uh, the meaning of Joseph, uh, Pharaoh's uh, dreams, I guess that's a better term. And uh, so uh, they're both 30. Um, Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him, and Jesus came into his own, his own received him not, right? So um, Joseph was revealed to his brothers at their second coming, Jesus was, will be revealed to Israel at the second coming. Uh, both offer forgiveness to those who sought to destroy them. Um, the evil Joseph's brothers intended, God meant for good to save them. Of course, same with Jesus. They did evil against Jesus, but that actually became the uh, you know catalyst of salvation. And I'll talk about that, I think, next week in our, in our Joseph study about uh, God meant it for good and the principle behind that. And um, uh, both uh, both became a savior of sorts. And uh, Joseph, of course, saved the world in the sense of storing up the food and providing food for the world. Jesus saved the world as far as eternally speaking from the sin of of uh, from sin and death and destruction and hell. And uh, <coughs> Joseph's sons Manasseh and Ephraim come through his Gentile wife and were given full tribe status. Gentiles who believe are considered full members. We're grafted into the family of God. And uh, so those are just some parallels. There might be other ones as well. And uh, But the, I've long since mentioned that the the parallels between the life of Joseph and the life of Jesus. I'm going to give you just three thoughts today, and uh, hopefully they'll be a help to you. Take your Bibles and turn to Genesis 39, and I'll read some verses here for you. Let me grab my Bible here. And... Uh, I always want to be a hand away from the Bible. Reach over and grab it. Keep it close by. And um, lots of books on the shelf, one on the desk, meaning it's the one you should be uh, near and dear to all times. And so Genesis 39 is where we're going to start. And so if you want to grab a Bible, and I'm actually want to start Genesis 37. The next point will be Genesis 39. Mia culpa on that one. And uh, Genesis 37. And uh, let's look at, let's see what we want. Verse number 12. And um, in this passage, and there's several passages about Joseph's life. 
where he's betrayed and uh, maybe the most difficult thing we go through is betrayal. We're all betrayed, as, I believe, at some point in our life to some degree, some much more severe than others. I've known people absolutely betrayed by a spouse. Uh, I've been people betrayed by their pastor. People betrayed uh, by church members, uh, family members. Uh, we've seen uh, betrayals of children by their parents and vice versa. And so a betrayal, again, is kind of hard to you know, pinpoint a specific definition as to you know, what betrayal is. And on a broader sense, in a broader term, especially, we've all faced some level of betrayal. I think of David's life. And I'll read the verses here in a second. <clears throat> David, outside of Christ, probably had the most occurrences of betrayal. Maybe Joseph's more severe in the sense that his own brothers tried to kill him. Of course, David's own son tried to kill him. And uh, But to have all the brothers ganging up on you, I can imagine Joseph crying for help and trying to talk some sense into it to his brothers and, and how can you do this to me with flesh and blood. And uh, so, but you have David, you have uh, people like Ahithophel in David's life, who was one of his mighty men, not mighty men, but his uh, counselors. And uh, he sided with Absalom. I think of the story of even in, um, I think it's First Samuel 30, going by memory, I think verse 6, where David encouraged himself in the Lord. And uh, after they'd got back to, to Ziglag, uh, there's 400 men with David. And uh, they got back to their to their little village there, and it was burned and pillaged, and the ladies had been taken, children too, and everybody was want to, you know, they blame David, and you know if you're a leader, that's uh, the blame goes on the leader oftentimes, and uh, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. So David had a lot of betrayal. Our Lord had a lot of betrayal. The Bible says, um, well, there's a psalm. It says. My, my friend, my familiar friend, uh, had lifted his hand against me. And that's David, but it's prophetic of Jesus. There's a verse in Zechariah, I believe it's chapter 13. I have the reference written down. I can look at it real quick. And uh, the, the psalm passage was Psalm 41.9. Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. And uh, that's the Psalm 41 verse. Zechariah 13 says, and one shall say, these are the wounds in thine hands. I'm sorry, what are these wounds in thy hands? Then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. So I'm about the piercing of the hands, Jesus wounded in the house of his friends. And we believe that's the betrayal of Judas Iscariot. And so, again, um, betrayal. Again, those are very severe examples. I, I've never faced betrayal on on those extreme levels maybe you have maybe you haven't maybe yours you know and it's not right for us to compare our betrayal levels i know mine's been minuscule uh, compared to many for which i'm thankful but i have felt times of betrayal and as a pastor even and uh, so uh, those things happen and uh, joseph in genesis 37 is betrayed by his brothers it says in verse 12 uh, and his brethren went to feed the father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said unto Joseph, <clears throat> Do not thy brethren feed the flock in Shechem? Come, and I will send thee unto them. And he said to, the, to him, here am, here am I. And he said, Go, I pray thee, and see whether they will be with thy brethren, if it be well with thy brethren, and uh, well with thy flocks, and bring me word again. So he sent out the veil of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a certain man found him, and behold, he was wandering in the field, and... The man asked him, saying, What seekest thou? He tells him about the brethren and such. And uh, so he goes to find them. And um, look at verse 17. And the, men, and the man said, They are departed for, uh, thence, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And when they saw him afar off, even before he came near unto them, they conspired against him to slay him. And they said one to another, Behold, the dreamer cometh. So... Again, the passage of Scripture, I believe, is familiar to you. And we see Joseph dealing with betrayal. He was betrayed by his brothers. I believe Potiphar's story 
There's also betrayal there. Uh, I believe personally that Potiphar probably knew that his wife was lying. And Potiphar, I believe, loved Joseph and took uh, him almost like a son to him. And Joseph helped Potiphar immensely. And through all this, even at that, once he was lied about, he sided uh, against Joseph and uh, even the butler betraying the, you know, I'll, I'll interpret your dreams for you, but you need to help me out as well. So there's multiple levels of betrayal. And uh, I think in the story, in the latter part of Genesis, where uh, Joseph is kind of toying with his brothers and uh, he's going to take Benjamin, the youngest, and, uh, and Reuben gets up and says, hey, listen, you, you can't do this. We already saw what happened to our father. They don't know it's Joseph, right? When he found out that the other son had died and take me instead. And so uh, it's just, you know, that come full circle type thing. And uh, so this idea of being betrayed, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be something you're going to need to work through. It's going to be something that might take maybe, you know, years or decades even to get fully through and fully understand and fully process. You may come full circle and there may be some level of reconciliation. There may be some exoneration or maybe not as well. And uh, sometimes it's just, uh, you know, some people betrayed by family members. Some have been betrayed, things like abuse and even sexual abuse. And those are ultimate betrayals. And sometimes there's no reconciliation on this side of eternity with the situation itself. But you do need to reconcile the fact that it happened and that you can move on through it and be healing. And it's not an overnight process. It's not just, you know, a snap of the finger. But betrayal is real. And we see betrayal, as I said, from David to Joseph to Christ. And we all have faced it to some degree. Many of us on very, you know, small levels, comparatively speaking to what these people were talking about. But nonetheless, it's real, and it's something we face, and something we have to work through, and it's something that took many years for Joseph to come full circle. And even at the very end, you know, they're, the brothers are saying, once Jacob died, you know, once, he, the only reason Joseph hasn't killed us yet is because because uh, dad's alive. Now that dad's gone, his dad was alive, now that dad's gone, he's going to kill us. And so they brought Joseph together. He said, hey, oh, by the way, right before dad died, he said, you know, forgive your brothers. Uh, you know, he told us to tell you to forgive us. And uh, Joseph said, am I in the place of God? You thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. And so he was able to kind of reconcile that own betrayal in his own heart. And again, sometimes you'll have opportunities to reconcile individually. Sometimes you'll have to reconcile the situation and sometimes you just have to reconcile the fact that there is no uh, solution and it's just something that you're going to have to work through. Again, it's not easy. I'm not asking you to not have feelings and hurt and wounds take a while to heal. And if you have small, you know, let's say you're in a car accident and you've got some cuts and bumps and bruises and a little bit of whiplash, a couple weeks, uh, other car crashes much more severe, might be a couple years for some. And some may walk with a limp the rest of their life affected by that betrayal. So uh, just about betrayal was my first thought for today. Let me get to my second thought. Um, look at Genesis 39, if you will. And Genesis 39. Of course, this is a story of Potiphar. And uh, again, I kind of gave you the, the, the brief synopsis of Joseph and his life. But it says... And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him um, of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him down thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. So the story goes on, talks about Potiphar, he advances in the house. Mrs. Potiphar has a thing for Joseph, and they're Egyptian, he's Hebrew, there's dynamics of you know different ethnicities maybe more of a an issue 
in some of those circles than maybe it is now, but then certainly wasn't uh, potentially an issue. She advances him, he refuses her advances, and then she lies about him. And, um, and the, the thought here is this, God's goodness is not dependent on the outcome. So we would say that God is good, of course, all the time, right? The old adage, God is good all the time, all the time God is good. And, uh, but um, we see that the outcome here is not favorable. As a matter of fact, we're like three situations in a row with unfavorable outcomes for Joseph, with a few more coming on the horizon. And so, but would you, would you question the goodness of God from our outside vantage point looking into the life of Joseph? Absolutely not. We, but if you were in Joseph's shoes, you might, because we're all flesh, and, and it's easy for us to look at the story of Job and say, you know, you know, the book of James speaks of the book of Job, and it says, you know, the patience of Job. And we talked a little bit about patience last week specifically, but now we're talking about the goodness of God in the trying times where we're displaying patience or lack of, sometimes is the case. So God is good. God is fundamentally good because God is God and God is good by his very nature. So we understand that God's goodness isn't contingent upon our approval of the outcomes of the situations that we're facing. Because quite frankly, we all face difficult situations. I think we have five or six widowers in our church, three of whom are under 50 years old, which is pretty incredible if you think about that. And, uh, that's, I mean, doesn't get any harder than that, right? Um, you know, losing a spouse, losing a child prematurely, those are, the, you know, especially if it's a young spouse, or any spouse for that matter, who am I to say, it? if you're married 50 plus years, uh, in that sense, maybe it's even harder. I mean, not that we're comparing anyways. I'm just, you know, saying uh, God's goodness is is there. And you say, well, at the end, Yes, it looked like God was in this whole thing, and, and Joseph even said, you know, God meant it for good. But it's his goodness was good even before chapter 50, chapter 37, and chapter 39, and chapter 40, when Joseph facing these trials in 41, early part of 41, God's still good. So it's a good reminder to us that God's goodness is not, um, you know, in question. God is fundamentally good, and bad time, bad things happen sometimes to us, sometimes because of the fault of our own, sometimes because of the free will of others, and sometimes as a trial, sometimes as a God's bragging rights, and sometimes just the circumstances of life. So any of those scenarios could be the rationale behind the struggles. And so God's good. He is just good. And my last thought, I want to show you one thing. Look at the, look at the Genesis 41 real quick. We don't fault Joseph for all the things that he went through. Matter of fact, there's no fault of his own. His brothers lied about him. I'm sorry, his brothers betrayed him. Uh, Potiphar's wife lied about him. The butler forgot him. He spent 14 years of his life from one tragedy to another tragedy, all the while he's trying to make the most of the situations and actually doing an okay job of making the most during those situations. But there's one thing about Joseph that is noteworthy to point out, and that's this. Joseph became Egyptian, and I'm not faulting him for that. I'm just saying it happened because of what he went through. And, uh, for example, let's look at Genesis 41, look at verse 45. It says, And Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence and went into Egypt throughout all the land. Of course, the seven years of plenty. Oh, that was verse 46. I need verse 45. Back up one verse. Uh, the four, <laughs> I read 46 just now. So let's go back one verse to verse 45. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath Paniah, and he gave him to wife Asenoth, the daughter of of Potiphar, priest of On, and Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. You know, like Daniel, Belshazzar, or Belteshazzar, 
and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Azar, and Mishael, right? They changed their names. And that's a ploy of, you know, the devil, and we still call him Joseph. But he was given an Egyptian name. He wore Egyptian clothing. Egypt is a type of the world, we understand that. We also know that the brothers didn't recognize him. He spoke so well with the dialect that they didn't question who he was. He is given a wife that's a non-believer. So, again, this is no fault of Joseph's. Sometimes life just throws us in crazy situations. But we may have baggage connected to those things. I mean, it might be that somebody grew up in the home of an alcoholic or a drug abuse, a drug addict, or maybe somebody was, you know, physically harmed or sexually harmed as a child, you know, abused. Those are absolute tragedies. And and Joseph didn't earn any, it just, just happened in Joseph's life. But he had to carry that baggage the rest of his life with him. And these things, you know, he 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 was affected by the circumstances of life. And so being a little bit, you know, mindful of that in the lives of others. I mean, I'm not a big tattoo guy uh, as far as I have zero tattoos. My kids say, you have a tattoo? No tattoos. I don't like tattoos myself personally. But a guy gets saved and he's, you know, got 100 tattoos on his body. Well, those are there for the rest of your life. I remember Buddy Blunkall, he was the first guest preacher that we had at our church. And uh, he's evangelist now in heaven. And uh, But uh, Brother Buddy had said that one of his uh, friends that he knew just traveling the country as an evangelist had just tattoos. And he had, you know, a big old tattoo on his shirt, on his the friend of Buddy's, not himself, but Buddy Buddy's friend that he met, now saved serving God. But this guy had a, you know, rough upbringing and he had a tattoo of, a topless girl on his arm and so he decided to go back to the tattoo parlor and have you know clothes put on the tattoo it's just one of those things you know what do you do and uh, people maybe introduced to drugs at a young age maybe brothers and sisters or even mom and dad got them high as a teenager and now here they are in their 20s or 30s and they're saved but they still have the effects of those things those things happen. It's just something that we should be mindful of and be, you know, in others and even in ourselves. And and by the way, sometimes we come to church, we put on this squeaky clean persona. And uh, I've had people say to me before, you know, Pastor, I don't belong in church. All these people are really, you know, super duper clean. And uh, oh, that just turned off. Oh, it's still going. Okay. Whew. That was weird. The The computer turned off and I thought it was done. I was about to get frustrated. I thought I'd have to do that whole thing again. Uh, but uh, but anyways, um, and I'm thinking to myself, and they're like, well, I'm not that. I'm thinking to myself, you know, number one, I'm not that. I want to be, but I'm not. We're all sinners saved by grace. We're just, there's no, there's ground is level at the foot of the cross. We all are struggling. We all have a past. We all have things we wished we'd done differently. We all have baggage. We all have struggles. But people portray themselves as such. And so don't be intimidated by that. We're all just a bunch of sinners. And we're carrying with us the, you know, the results of things inflicted on us by others and also our own poor decisions. I think verse 50 also was one I wanted to show you. And... Um, it just talks about his two sons born there, and so that affected his own children. So Manasseh and Ephraim were born in uh, verse fifty, and Joseph were and unto Joseph were born two sons before the year of the famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him, and Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, and of course Ephraim. So the even the children, you know, their cousins, I guess they'd be called cousins, but half brothers, I'm not sure what that would be but uh they were all born in the family of of israel and these two were born in egypt so they had a little bit of different upbringing than the others had so that's it for today a little about 30 minutes i guess now so 
Uh, we'll call that a Bible study. Thanks for watching all the way till the end. And again, I thought that thing blinked off there for a second. And uh, I thought when it blinked off, it shut off, but it didn't. So I'm glad because I got to process this now. So anyways, let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time together. Thankful for the study tonight. We ask that you bless mightily. We give you the praise, honor, and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless.